one do? Utah Sweet. I was in a uh, plaza in uh, Greece, and it was a very hot day. And this gentleman came into the plaza with a push cart, and it was shaved ice. And they had all these pomegranates. They didn't look like our red pomegranate. They looked more like this. All on top of the shaved ice. And I stood there and I watched. People would walk up with a coin, give him the coin, he would take a pomegranate, he would massage it, stick a hole in it, put a straw in it, and they walked away. <laughs> All right? Don't try that one, it's wonderful. It has a very crunchy outside skin. It'll burst on you, and it'll make a mess. But this one has a very pliable skin. If you're very interested in a lot of the unusual edible plants, particularly the fruits, become a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers. They're very, very active in this area. They have a huge, big orchard down in San Jose at Cruz Park. They open it up four or five times a year for tastings of all this fruit we can grow here, and they have lots of unusual pomegranates, among other things. That's where I got my pomegranate. I didn't go to the nursery, okay? Um, persimmons. This is the uh, Haichia, which is not my favorite because it has to get very, very soft before you can eat it. Otherwise, if you ever bite into one, you will remember it for the rest of your life. <laughs> if you are mad at someone and they never have one, you handle one and say, oh, yeah, I have this. Um, so effectively, I like the Fuyu type, the ones that are crisp. Uh, I was around them for years. You know, okay, I'd put them in smoothies for the kids when they got soft. And then I found out I could slice them up and in little cubes put them on my um, oatmeal in the morning. Fabulous, with a little plain yogurt. And then I, I remember having been in Italy years ago and seeing prosciutto wrapped around melon. And I thought, why not? So now for Thanksgiving, we use the Fuyu persimmon, cut it in eighths or tenths, wrap it with prosciutto, and that's the first course, and it's much lighter. Wait, I hope you ate before you came. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. That's the Fuyu, I mean the, the Haichia close. Uh, my lemon tree fell over a number of years ago in a storm, and I said, hey, I really like it that way, <laughs> and I built an arbor for it, okay? Much easier to pick the lemons. All you have to do, you know, you're, you're right in the tree, it gets more sun, so it does better. And it's beautiful, right? It frames the view. So don't ever think that all these trees that you say, okay, well, like the farmer, I have to have it like, you know, a lollipop standing there, you know, that's all I know. Trees are like trees I grew as a five-year-old, you know? Uh-uh. Trees can take many, many different shapes, and there are many of them that are very pliable. You could do the same thing with a fig. You could do the same thing with any of the citrus, you can do the same thing with apples. I, I have a dream of my front walk being an arbor covered with um, persimmons. And then you'd have uh, roses on the front of the arbor, roses on the back, and then persimmons down the middle. Okay? All right. If you have enough property, you can put a bunch of different fruit trees together, as a farmer would, except that you would put flowers under because what you know now, after I tell you, if you don't already know from a master garden class, is that almost all the beneficial insects that control the bad guys need pollen and nectar at some point in their reproductive cycle. They need it to reproduce. So if you do not have flowers around, your good guys go off someplace else or they never reproduce. So a good, healthy, vegetable garden, a good healthy um, orchard, any edible garden needs flowers, lots of flowers. Next. Simple, you tell me, okay, I have problems with squirrels, I have problems with deer, I have problems with rabbits, you know, whatever. Um, four peach trees, beautiful sculpture, right off of the living room window. Gravel underneath so this, if some of them, you know, splat. No big deal to clean it up. Easy to walk around, should do any pruning and picking. It's just we have to think through. It's not the plant, it's how we've been using it. 
We don't have to be in that box anymore. And how is that big for squirrels? Oh, the squirrels. Uh, the, you see this? This is metal, uh -huh. and they can't run over it. And there are no trees or anything that overhang so that they can jump in. Um, this is in Los Altos. This is a chestnut tree. Beautiful in the spring. And the squirrels can't get these. You can get those before because they have a prickery um, husk on it. Do I have a picture of that? I can't Yes. See the, see? So when they start to open up, then you know, ah, uh -uh, time to harvest. And then you get them before the squirrels do. So fruits, nuts, shrubs, blueberries. I, I, I have to tell you, I got so many blueberries this year that I got tired. <laughs> I went out morning after morning after morning. What's that? What varieties? I had two sunshine blue, misty, and a Berkeley. Four. And that was enough to keep going for about four months. And I finally said to the neighborhood kids, okay, you can have them, because they've been asking me. And they, they're very good. They know. This is for Roz. This is for the kids. This is for Roz. This is for the kids. They can have the strawberries always, but the blueberries they always have to have. Okay. I grow mine in both. The key to growing uh, blueberries is soil pH. And there's a tremendous amount of information on growing blueberries in the Santa Clara Valley. We are blessed. We had as our extension agent, for university extension agent for many years, Nancy Garrison. And she trialed out many, many dozens of varieties and saw which ones do best here. And they have a lot of that is, should be on the Master Gardener website. And California Rare Fruit Growers has information about it. And some, you know, my book has information about it, all that. You will find lots of information. One of the key things in growing blueberries is soil pH. You must keep it very acidic. They cannot bring, they have very strange roots. They're kind of brown and wiry. They're not white roots. And so they can only take up a certain amount of nutrients. You can kill them if you put any strong um, commercial fertilizer on them. And, but if you use compost, I use a little my chicken manure. And I use sulfur the way I would if I had azaleas. But the other issue is that we have, you can't use just drip irrigation under your blueberries. The soil, when soil dries out, it loses its acidity. It turns alkaline. And our irrigation water is alkaline. So you have to keep it wet. You have to keep it with lots of organic matter and sulfur. And I use little spray heads underneath my, all my blueberry bushes. Okay? Okay. This is pineapple guava. The flowers are absolutely delicious. The birds and the squirrels go after the flowers as much as they do the fruit. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it still pollinates and you don't lose any fruit. Yep. That's the fruit if you're not familiar with it. And you scoop it out and it has a kind of a tropical resinous flavor to it. Okay. Strawberries. I find if I grow strawberries that dangle out of something, I have all different kinds of strawberry um, situations, that, and they all dangle. If you have this on the ground, they tend to rot. They tend to get slugs in them. They get pill bugs in them. And they, uh, the birds are more apt to get them. When they do that, the birds really can't hover. And the slugs don't, I guess, no, they're not smart enough to go find it. I don't know why. They find everything else. <laughs> Um, but the fact of the matter is, if you want to grow them, there's a reason they have strawberry jars. And, and uh, you can buy all 